there are several indicators that are used to look at the spread of data. One is the range, of course, the most obvious, which is the maximum value minus the minimum value. That indicates the overall range of the data. So, for example, if we have a set of uh, prices of products, then the range, the spread, is going to be the lowest price. Let's say the lowest price product is 99 cents, and the highest price product, let's say, is uh, 15.99. Then the spread or the range is going to be 99 cents to 15.99 or 15 dollars. That's the overall range. Another good indicator of the spread of data is what is called as the interquartile range. IQR, which is essentially the difference between the values at the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. So continuing our example of prices, let's say the 25th percentile was at $2 and the 75th percentile, let's say, was at $10. Then IQR would be 10 minus 2, that's $8. Interquartile range. That is the difference between the value at the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. That's the IQR. Of course, it's possible that uh, the, the values may be in a different order, ascending or descending order, so you can appropriately uh, interpret this. Variance is the average of the squared deviations of the data values from the mean. We look at it shortly, how to calculate the variance, and of course, you're probably familiar with it already. Standard deviation is nothing but the square root of variance, uh, so if that is the case, then of course one needs to talk about why do we need both of those. If one is simply the square root of the other, why not just use either one of them? Well, there's a good enough logic for why we use standard deviation, and we'll get into all of that shortly. Another good indicator of how the data is spread is what is called as a cumulative distributed function, uh, which is sort of a graphical view of the complete percentile table. So here, what this indicates is the percentage of values below a given value, which is exactly uh, the percentile for a given value, right? So here, you've got the variable you're plotting. In this case, it, it's the median value of the household, of the household price. And uh, so you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. What this is telling you is that uh, if you draw a line all the way up from 30, it reaches the 80th percentile. What it tells you is that 80% of the households have a median value of less than or equal to 30. That's what this shows. Now, incidentally, you see that there's not one curve, but there are three different curves. The solid line indicates the data plotted for all values. And the dashed line and the dotted line indicate the values for the the two different values that exist for the variable chas. So for example, the dashed line indicates for the households for which chas equals no, that is household or neighborhoods that do not border the Charles River, that the cumulative values are shown by the dashed line, which is almost identical to the solid line. And uh, the dotted line shows the distribution or the cumulative distribution for households which do adjoin the Charles River. So you can see that that curve differs quite strongly from the curve for the overall. Now, partly this is also an artifact of the number of values. You'd see that out of the 506 values, most of them are really neighborhoods that do not adjoin the Charles River. Uh, so I think only about 10% of the values actually adjoin the Charles River. So it makes sense that the distribution for houses that uh, neighborhoods that do not adjoin the Charles River would be very similar to the overall. Whereas, because there are fewer cases of uh, neighborhoods that do adjoin the Charles River, there's, there's scope for the distribution of that to be very different. That's what you're seeing here. For now, we'll just focus on the overall curve. And what it shows you is for every given value of the variable we are plotting, the y-axis shows you how many values are less than equal to that given value. Of course, Ultimately, all the cumulative density functions or distribution functions will have to end at 1.0 because 100% of the values are going to be less than the maximum value. Okay, So that's why you will find the CDFs or cumulative distribution functions always starting at 0, reaching 1. But what is interesting is essentially the starting point, ending point are exactly the same. 
the interesting thing is the path between the starting point and the ending point so you may have one in which the, it, it sort of stays low for a long time and then grows rapidly another which shoots up initially and then grows uh, sort of gradually towards one or something like what we are seeing here which has a fairly sharp initial growth and then gradually uh, reaches one okay so you could compare different variables for how their cumulative distribution looks and get an idea about uh, the distribution of values for that particular variable okay so here we plotted in rattle and uh, we got three different charts one for overall and then for no and yes uh, because in in rattle we chose chas as the target variable and when you do that and plot the cumulative distribution function or many other things that you do in in rattle it it shows you the overall chart but it also shows you the chart for your target variable usually if the target variable is a uh, is a categorical variable or if it's a numerical variable doesn't matter whichever way it is it'll get you this kind of a graph or this kind of set of graphs so here we can see that more than 80 percent of the values are below 30 as we just discussed for chas equals yes we see that the values are clearly higher okay that's because you can see here that a lower percentage of the values are uh, less than a given particular value so for example if you take the value 20 right so what it tells you is roughly 20 percent of the households have a median value less than 20 in the category adjoining the river whereas for uh, less than 20 almost 40 percent of the overall households have a value less than 20. So clearly the properties that are adjoining the river are much more expensive. Now let's get into a little bit of terminology. Now in statistics, as you are definitely aware, you talk about population and a sample of the population. Population indicates the overall set of items you're talking about. For example, if you're talking about uh, households in the United States, the population, of course, is all households of the United States. There might be something like 100 million households in the US. So when you talk about the population there, you're talking now about the, all of those members of the population. Sample is some small segment of the population that has been selected. That's a sample. For statistical studies, you usually select a sample of the population because performing activities on the entire population is costly. For example, the United States government conducts a census only once every 10 years because census is a complete survey of the entire population. It's not a sample. Every single household, they try to gather information about. And of course, it's a costly process. It's a time consuming process and it's done very rarely. For analysis purposes, typically you sample the data, make some studies of the sample, do some calculations, calculate things about the sample, and then from that make inferences about the population. Now, of course, you may calculate the same kind of things for both the population and the sample, but when something is calculated for the population, that is referred to as a parameter. When the same thing is calculated for a sample, it is referred to as a statistic. To make things concrete, suppose we consider the average salary of a US household. In this case, if you calculate the average salary across every single household in the US, across the population, then that mean is called as a parameter. That is the population mean, and that is referred to as a parameter, whereas a sample mean is a statistic. That suggests a terminology difference between parameters and statistics, or between things calculated for the population and things calculated for the sample. So, correct use of the terminology that's why i call the slide as being proper formulas for the mean of course we know how to calculate the mean for population mean you sum across the entire population you say mu is what is usually used to refer to the population mean so mu the greek symbol mu is used to refer to the population mean and of course you calculate it by summing up from one all the way up to uppercase n uppercase n is usually used in statistics to refer to the 
sample population size, size of the population. So you say sigma i equal to 1 to capital N, x of i, which is, let's say you're talking about salary of household, then x of i would be salary of the ith household, where you vary that i from 1 to all the households, to the maximum household number. And you divide the total, of course, by the total number of values you have, which is the population size n. So this is essentially calculating the average, adding up all the values, dividing by n, except that when you're calculating population mean, you're talking about all the members of the population. Whereas if you do the same thing with the sample, so instead of doing the calculation for the entire population, let's say you select a set of households, and let's say a set of 1,000 households, that's going to be your sample. When you calculate the mean for that, you're now going to sum from 1 to just 1,000, which is the size of your sample, not the size of the population, which is uppercase n. So you sum up all the values of your sample divided by the sample size, which is n. Again, you're taking the average of all the numbers, except that this time, you're not, you're, the items you're calculating with are only members of the sample and not the entire population. In Excel, you can use the function average to calculate the mean. And in R, you can use the function mean to calculate the mean. Okay, and the symbol used for sample mean usually is x bar. Bar, which is the bar on top of x, that is what indicates that you're now talking about a sample and not the population. Incidentally, what are the units in which mean is expressed? If you look at the numbers, so for example, you're talking about, let's say, the household incomes, then whether you're talking of population mean or sample mean, Every single element that you're adding up is a figure expressed in dollars. Household income, $50,000, $60,000, $100,000, $200,000. So each one of these XIs is a dollar figure. When you total it all up, of course, you still have a dollar figure. When you divide that by N, N is just the number, number of people who, a number of households you sampled. So that's a dimensionless quantity. It has no dimension. So when you divide dollars by a dimensionless quality, what you're left with is dollars. So mean, obviously, is a value whose units are dollars, if you're measuring household income in dollars, okay, in this particular example. So mean has units, and the units of the mean are the same as the units of whatever it is that you're measuring. And the important thing is, since the mean has the same units as the things that you're measuring, it's a useful thing. It's something that makes sense. So you can say the average salary is $50,000. A particular person's salary is $70,000. So you can compare those two things because they are in the same units. They become commensurate. Let's switch to one other kind of display that shows you the distribution of values. And it's a display that has become pretty popular in statistics. It's called a, it's statistics. It's called a box plot. And what it shows you is, in a diagrammatic way, it shows you a lot of different things about how the value is distributed. So this is an example of a block of a box plot. And in this case, we have plotted the industrialization of the data from Boston housing dot CSV. Okay. So what it's showing you, a box plot typically has this kind of a structure. It's got a box in the middle, of course, which explains why it's called a box plot. And it's got lines on top and bottom. And it's got another big line running through it. And it's got one line, a solid line in the middle of the box. There are other things also that people add on to box plot, but this is the, the basic box plot. Now, what does it, what information does it contain? Of course, notice on the y-axis, there's the scale. So INDUS in this case is measured on a scale with values ranging from zero up to about 28 or so. And what you're seeing here is, there are several things. The line on the bottom indicates what is the minimum value of that uh, attribute or variable. So the minimum value you can see here is pretty close to zero. And the line on top, as you might have guessed, shows the maximum value, which is little more than 25. Uh, it looks like it's about 28 or 29. That's the maximum. And therefore, the middle value, you can guess the solid line is the median. Now, if you remember, earlier we had said the median is the middle value. So why is it that this median is not exactly at the midpoint of max and min? That's worth thinking about. 
Why is it that the line for median is not exactly in the middle? Because we said median is the middle value. Now remember, median is a middle value, but it's not just the midpoint of max and min. Median is calculated by arranging all the values in order and taking the value which falls at the midpoint. So for example, if you have uh, 99, if you have three values, for example, the mid value is two. Let's say the three values are 1, 1, and 5. Suppose those are the three values, then the median is actually 1 because the midpoint is the second value and the second value happens to be 1. So if you have five values, median will be the third value. So let's say your five values were 1, 2, 3, 8, and 10. Then median is 3. And it's clearly not the midpoint of minimum minus maximum. That would be 5.5, but the third value was 3, 1, 2, 3, 8, 10. The third value was 3, so that is the median. Okay, that is why the median does not necessarily have to fall in exactly at the exactly at the midpoint of minimum and maximum. So what this diagram, this box plot actually shows you is that there are more values above the median than there are below the median. That is what the location of the line tells you. So clearly this distribution is right, skewed to the right because there are more, va more values above the median than below the median. So the tail is on the right. Okay, so we have understood the three uh, indicators there. Now what does the box itself represent? The box represents where on the scale the first quartile and the third quartile fall. So what this is telling us is 25% of the values are less than or equal to 5 because that's where the bottom of the box is. And it tells you also that, uh, let's say this is about 18, 75% of the values are less than or equal to 18 or so. Okay, so the starting point and ending point of the box tell us where the 25th and the 75th percentile fall. So these, this is the, the, these are the basic elements of a box plot. It shows you the maximum, the minimum, shows you the median, and it shows you the first and the third quartiles. And as I had described earlier, the interquartile range is nothing but the distance between the third quartile and the first quartile. That is referred to as the IQR or the interquartile range. Of course, Box plots also show other points. For example, if you take this box plot, this box plot is showing us all the elements that we had seen earlier, which is the two bars, maximum, minimum, the box, the median, everything. But it also has things outside of the lines of the minimum and maximum. Okay. Now, how is it possible for values to be outside, below minimum or above maximum? That doesn't seem possible. But what has actually happened is that this box plot includes what are called as outliers. Now in any data set, there will be some, there might be some extreme values which look like they are completely outside of the normal range of values. Those are called outliers and it's good practice to eliminate outliers from any data set before we start performing analysis. Okay, that is because outliers will tend to skew our results. And by definition, outliers are values which are not typical values for that particular attribute or variable. So there's no sense in using them in our analysis. To go back to our analysis of incomes of people, if you have 100 people who are normal working people, and then you've got uh, extremely rich people like Bill Gates and uh, uh, Warren Buffett in that same uh, set of data, obviously, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett salaries are so huge compared to the others, their, their incomes are so huge compared to the others, that they would be considered outliers. And in any analyses we perform with the data, we would like to remove them and perform the analysis. Otherwise, our analysis will be completely misled by those extremely high values. Similarly, let's say you take a different example. You have the scores that students uh, obtained on a particular test. Let's say there are 30 students in the class most of the scores are lying, let's say, between 75 and 93. 
but then there are a few people who scored in the 40s and 30s. Those are clearly outliers because if you include them in computing averages and things like that, then they will pull down the class average, but that would not be a fair indication of the typical class student. So in these cases, what you will do is you will eliminate the outliers and then perform your analyses on the rest. So the box plot with values above and below the maximum and minimum are, is actually showing us who are the outliers. So what it does is it calculates the maximum and minimum after excluding the outliers. How are outliers calculated? Of course, it's a rule of thumb that is typically used. Outliers are calculated as anything that lies over 1.5 interquartile range from the 25th or the 75th percentile. So for example, values that are above the third quartile plus 1.5 IQR are considered outliers and values that lie below uh, 1.5 IQRs of the 25th quartile are considered outliers. Okay, so that's how, that's how you calculate outliers in your, uh, that, that is what outliers in the box plot indicate. So here you've got the box plot with outliers and essentially then we now have to redefine what the upper and lower line indicate. Earlier we said that they represent the minimum and maximum, uh, the lower line indicating the minimum, upper line indicating the maximum. That's not true because the above line is actually the lower of the maximum or the highest value below the 75th percentile. Okay, because uh, if the maximum is lower than that, then that's going to be the maximum. Whereas if the maximum is less than uh, the value which is uh, 75th percentile plus 1.5 times the IQR, then that's going to be the maximum because values above that will become uh, outliers and therefore get eliminated. Similarly, uh, for the lower line. Okay, so comparing box plots for different variables gives us an idea of the distribution of each of those variables. Okay, so here you see uh, three different box plots done side by side. You've got the box plot for median value. And here you see that the median value has lots of outliers. That is indicated by the fact that there are things outside of the maximum minimum range. But other than that, within the normal range, it looks like this is more or less uh, symmetrically or normally distributed. It's uh, balanced. So because the median is falling right in the middle and there seem to be more or less equal number of values above and below the median. So that looks like a symmetric distribution. Whereas age it distrib is distributed very differently because there are lots of values which are below the median, which tells us that this is a left skewed distribution. There's a long tail on the left and then the peak is occurring somewhere to the right. And it also shows us that within the uh, within the first and third quartile range also, the skew is still present because the median line is sort of on the top of the box. It shows us that there are no outliers in age. Tax shows us again that it's a right skewed distribution. Many of the values are above the median, so it's a right skewed distribution. It also shows us that the interquartile range is very large for tax. Lots of values fall within the 25th to 75th percentile. Uh, so that's what it shows us here. So here what we would want to do, what we'd like to do is to compare the median price of homes in neighborhoods which adjoin the river and which don't adjoin the river. So we want to produce two side-by-side -side box plots. In fact, before we do this, we should actually do a regular box plot and then look at this side-by-side -side box plot. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, get out of the presentation and do a short demo of how to create box plots in our commander. Uh, Excel can do box plot, but uh, by default, the data analysis tool pack doesn't have it. So I'm just going to focus on R and specifically focus on R commander. Later on, you'll see that Rattle also can do box plots, uh, but it's you can figure that out yourself. It's also covered in the book.